Hello. 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 Hello.
turn now to our time of confession, the point in our service at which together we consider the lives that we've lived, the things that we've said and done which we wish we hadn't, the thoughts that we've had and the things that we've not said and not done that we wish that we had. We're going to say uh, sorry to God in a moment in the words of the confession and then we'll listen to the words of absolution. Let's be quiet though first, just to remember in each of our hearts those things which we regret and for which we want to seek the forgiveness of our Heavenly Father. And so we confess, please join me in the words on the screen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. And so may the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. Let's turn then to the Word of God and to the reading from Mark's Gospel. We're reading from Mark chapter 8 and starting at verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him 
along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, as we reflect on these words from Jesus, will you open our hearts and minds to what you're saying to us today. Amen. When we look on social media or watching TV or driving or walking by a billboard, we might see phrases like this. You're worth it. If it makes you happy, look out for number one. More, more, more. Now these kind of adverts can trick us into believing that the way to happiness is found through pursuing pleasures and possessions and achievements. But actually none of these ultimately satisfy. In fact, when we make pleasure and power and possessions our gods, when we worship them, we become actually less satisfied and we become more selfish and we just crave more and more and more. Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. What does it mean to deny yourself? Well, we might think of it as being not eating certain things like ice cream or chocolate or not being able to have alcohol or whatever other thing you've decided to give up for Lent. And instead having to endure um, some horrible cocktail of healthy healthiness that you've had to blend in a cup that's come all green that I had to when I was doing this um, reboot diet. But actually that's not what Jesus is talking about here. When Jesus says deny yourself, he's saying we need to say no to ourselves. Say no to our own selves. So it's not aestheticism, it's not going without stuff, it's not about hiding oneself away in a cave like the early church fathers and mothers used to do. That's not what it's about. It's actually about disowning yourself. The Greek verb that is translated deny is aponeomai, which means to disown. And it's used in the story of Peter when he denies Jesus in chapter 14. Peter disowns Jesus. And Jesus tells us we need to disown ourselves. So the attitude that is called for is one in which self-interest and personal desires are no longer central. If you want to be a disciple, then Jesus says you must renounce yourself. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, says these words. The disciple must say to himself or herself the same words Peter said of Christ when he denied him. I know not this man. Self-denial is, is never just a series of isolated acts of mortification or asceticism. It is not suicide, for there's an element of self-will even in that. To deny oneself is to be aware only of Christ and no more of self. To see only him who goes before and no more the road which is too hard for us. Once more, all that self-denial can say is, he leads the way. Keep close to him.
So Jesus says, deny yourself. Then he says, take up your cross. Just before these verses, Jesus in verse 31 began to teach the disciples that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Now when Peter hears this word, he is furious. What are you talking about, Jesus? You're the Messiah, you can't die. That's not what victory looks like. But then Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, accuser, to Peter. And says, look, the way of Jesus is a way of, of taking up your cross. Taking up your cross refers to the practice of making a condemned person carry their own crossbeam upon which they were to be tied or nailed to the place of their execution. Death by crucifixion was a Roman execution by state authorities familiar in ancient Jewish life on account of the Jews rebelling, that rebelled and were caught and executed. Harry Hurtado in his commentary on Mark says, when Mark's first readers read these words, they could have understood them only as a warning that the discipleship might mean execution. The cross was not just an indication of possible death for disciples, it was a warning of execution by the state authorities. Thus, in the same way that Jesus' ministry led him to a collision with both Jewish and Roman authorities, the disciples and readers are warned to be prepared for the same sort of trouble. There are many people in our world who are risking their lives to follow Jesus, particularly in the 1040 window, which kind of spans kind of North Africa, the Middle East, places like India and China and Pakistan. And in those places, it's dangerous to be a Christian. You might have to meet in your church underground or in people's homes, not in a public building. And for some people, it's even cost them their life. Now, we're fortunate not to be in this situation, but we can still make sacrifices for Jesus. For example, we might work for a Christian organisation or a church, and as a result, get paid less than if we were working elsewhere. Or maybe we make a sacrifice of praying for somebody, even though we might be embarrassed about doing so. Dietrich Bonhoeffer again said in Cost of Discipleship, the cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering which every man must experience is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old man which is the result of his encounter with Christ. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. Thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. When I became a Christian, I literally did this. I, I gave up my old life and I was born again in Christ. I turned away from my sin and I turned towards Jesus. And although life's not always easy, it's the best thing I've ever, ever done. Making that choice to deny Jesus, to take up uh, my cross and to follow him, and dying to myself. So when we think about taking up our crosses, what does it actually mean? Well, it's not, for example, what's expressed in these words, that's my cross to bear. For some people, they see it as a burden that they must carry, a strained relationship, a, a thankless job, a physical illness, but that's not what Jesus is talking about here. What Jesus is saying is that we need to be willing to die to self to follow Jesus giving up all areas of our life, all of our ambitions to follow Jesus 
absolute surrender. Now, although the call is tough, the reward is matchless. If you give up your life for my sake, Jesus promises that you will save it. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow Jesus. Discipleship means following in the same path and being ready to share in the same fate as the one who leads. Those who want to follow Jesus must follow him even when he's carrying a cross. Following Jesus can be hard. It can be difficult. But we don't always know what's best for us. And sometimes we need to recognise that Jesus knows what's best. Following Jesus means saying yes to Jesus and no to other things that might cause us or others harm. It means following Jesus in his footsteps, walking with him, doing what he came to do, loving God, loving our neighbours as ourselves, sharing and showing the good news of Jesus in our community, standing up for injustice. Being a Christian isn't always the easiest life, but ultimately it is the best life. It's also a life where Jesus is with us the whole journey, carrying our burdens with us, bearing the load and leading the way, speaking to us and guiding us. We don't have to face the challenges of life alone, but we have Jesus with us by his Holy Spirit. Do you follow Jesus? Or have you been following someone else? We have every good intention of following Jesus. But then stuff happens in our lives. And that can take us off in other directions. We get distracted. However, there is always a way back to Jesus. And that is through repentance. That's about turning around, saying sorry to Jesus for wandering off and asking his Holy Spirit to come fill us afresh to help us to follow him. So are you ready to deny yourself, to take out your cross and to follow Jesus? We're going to have a moment of quiet. And just to reflect on whether that's something we want to do, either for the first time or as a recommitment. And then once we've had a a moment of quiet, I'm going to invite you to join in with some words, which will appear on the screen. So if you want to make a recommitment to Jesus or maybe you want to commit to Jesus for the first time and make that sin to follow him, I'm going to invite you to join in with the words that will appear in yellow on your screen. To follow Jesus means dying to sin and rising to new life with him. Therefore I ask, do you reject the devil and all rebellion against God? I reject them. Do you renounce the deceit and corruption of evil? I renounce them. Do you repent of the sins that separate us from God and neighbour? I repent of them. Do you turn to Jesus as Saviour? I turn to Jesus. Do you submit to Jesus as Lord? I submit to Jesus. Do you come to Jesus, the way, the truth and the life? I come to Jesus. Will you deny yourself? Take up your cross and follow Jesus daily with God's help. I will follow Jesus daily. And now I pray, Holy Spirit, come fill us all afresh now. Help us, Lord, to deny ourselves, to take up your cross, to follow you daily. Fill us with your Holy Spirit.
the less loyalty overflowing so that your love may overflow through us. We pray in the most precious name of Jesus. Amen. In our prayers today, we're going to pick up that word, that concept of disowning, of denying. And as we pray for the church, for the world, for those who need our prayers, we'll ask for God's courage for ourselves and for the world. The response is a little different from usual. I will say, Lord, meet us in the silence, for there will be a moment's silence. Give us strength, you say, and hear our prayer. Give us strength and hear our prayer. So let us pray. We pray to the Lord for courage to disown other things and to follow him this Lent. Give your church, Lord, the courage to disown her own preoccupation with herself and to own more time for your mission in the world. We pray for the work of the church throughout the world, particularly in the trouble spots. That we pray for the work of the church in this country, for our archbishops. And we pray for the work of the church in our own community, for all the activities where we endeavour to bring the love of Christ to our neighbours. May the blood and water flowing from the side of Jesus bring forgiveness to your people and help us to face the cost of proclaiming salvation. Lord, meet us in the silence. Give us strength and hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, give your world the courage to disown war bitterness and hatred and to seek peace. We continue to pray for the position in Ukraine, for the position in Israel and Palestine and Gaza. We pray for the position in Sudan and in other war-torn parts of the world. Lord, may the shoulders of the risen Jesus, once scourged by soldiers, bear the burden of political and military conflict in our world. Lord, meet us in the silence, give us strength and hear our prayer. Lord, give us the courage to disown quarrels, strife and jealousy in our families, neighbourhoods and communities. In a moment's quiet we pray for any such situations of strife that may be known to us. May the presence of the risen Jesus, his body once broken and now made whole, bring peace and direction as we live with one another. Lord, meet us in the silence, give us strength, and hear our prayer. Give us courage to disown our selfishness as we live for others, and to give time, care, and comfort to the sick. Again, a moment's quiet while we think of any known to us or given to us to love who are unwell. May the wounded hands of Jesus bring his healing touch 
and the light of his presence fill their rooms. Lord, meet us in the silence. Give us strength and hear our prayer. And give us courage to disown our own fear of death and to rejoice with those who've died in faith. A moment just to hold any special names who have recently been bereaved or have passed. May the feet of the risen Lord Jesus, once nailed to the cross, walk alongside the dying and bereaved in their agony and walk with us and all your church through death to the gate of glory. The Lord, meet us in the silence. Give us strength and hear our prayer. And we end our prayers by saying together the prayer that Jesus taught us. We say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. In our closing hymn, we return to the cross. When I survey the wondrous cross, we sing, on which the Prince of Glory died.
And so we've reached the end of our service together. Thank you once again for joining uh, us today. And we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Can I encourage you to go to our website? The details are now on the screen just to see what is going on in the parish, to see our latest newsletter, amongst other things. And then let's join together in praying for one another in the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.